Exodus chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4, uh, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 3, sorry, Exodus chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 1, and I'm going to invite Jacob and Hosanna to come to the front. Here's a, a microphone, it's all ready to go here for you, a handheld, and they're going to lead us in the scripture reading, and they're going to pray for the message today. So would you join us by standing, please, let's stand for the reading of God's word. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you are here with us. We thank you for your word, that you speak to us. Lord, we pray that you would open our ears and our hearts to hear from you this morning. We thank you that you care for us, that you, um, you hurt for those who are oppressed, and you long to give us more freedom and rescue us. Thank you, God. Amen. Well, if you would take your Bibles and turn, if you haven't already, to the book of Exodus, and I want to welcome those who are online uh, joining us this morning. Thank you for being with us. If you have a prayer request, uh, we have a Facebook page. You're probably watching on the Facebook Live, and you can go there, and you can request to go into a group we have called Ridge Prayer. We would love to pray for you, so even while this service is going on, or later in the week, if you're watching it later, uh, you can go back into Ridge Prayer and you can request to get in and share a prayer request that you may have. So welcome to all of you who are joining us online. Well, as we look at Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 22 today, we learn about God's call to Moses. God's call to Moses is what we see in chapter 3. The Lord says to Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and I want you to bring my people out of Egypt, so they can worship me. And Moses has been prepared for this moment. God's been preparing him for 40 years for this moment. He's been prepared by being a shepherd in a desert. He's watching somebody else's sheep. He was prepared because when he left Egypt, he sat down by a well. He let things settle in his soul. He found out who it is God had called him to be through times of silence, perhaps, and solitude. So Moses is ready. Moses is ready to shepherd someone else's sheep, God's people. And God knew that his people could not be led out of a desert by somebody who had never been to a desert. And that's where Moses has been for 40 years. So this is God's call to Moses in chapter 3. 
And the question I have for us today as followers of Jesus is how do we hear God's call on our lives? How do we discover the purpose God has for us as we follow Jesus? And so with that in mind, we're going to look at this. Now, I know when we talk about God's call, callings are so, they're easy to misunderstand because they sound so certain. God called me to do this. As if it's always done with exclamation points. And you're to discover that, that coming to understand God's call on your life, there's not a lot of exclamation points. It's not a boom, one and done experience. Because usually when God calls us, it raises more questions. And the questions that we're willing to ask are sometimes more important than the answers we think we know. There's a quote I came across by a gentleman named Greg Lavoie, and he writes this in his book called Callings. He writes this, it's on the screen. He says, calls are essentially questions. They aren't questions you need to answer outright. They are questions to which you need to respond, expose yourself, and kneel before. You don't want an answer you can put in a box and set on a shelf. You want a question that will become a chariot to carry you across the breadth of life. And what you're going to see in Exodus chapter 3 are a series of questions in the text. Questions that I believe will carry us, and if you want to follow along and you're taking notes in your outline, questions that will carry us as we follow Jesus, as we discover our call, our purpose in life. So look with me in Exodus 3, verse 3, where it says, So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Verse 4, when the Lord saw, now notice this, the Lord saw, that Moses had gone over to look, then God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Which just begs the question, does God speak if we're too busy to stop and look and notice? This was a normal day for Moses tending the sheep. This is no different than any other day. This is a normal bush. Bushes catch on fire all the time. And so there's Moses seeing another bush burn. But this one's different. Something ordinary about, very ordinary about these bushes. But this is different. He noticed something. He noticed something because he stopped. And he paid attention. So the first question we need to ask is this. Are you paying attention? Would you write that down? Am I paying attention? Am I paying attention? Am I noticing? Am I seeing? Or, or am I so bitter that I'm in this wilderness and left this incredible past behind me? Or am I so angry because of the way my life's turned out? Or am I, am I too busy with what's right in front of me with sheep, that I, I walk by the very thing God put in my path to get my attention. Does, can God even speak to us if we're too busy, if we're too angry, if we're too bitter, if we're too preoccupied? Can God speak to us if we don't give our attention to the little things God puts in front of us, the burning bushes? There's a great Bible study, and I think many of you have probably heard of it. Maybe you've gone through it, called Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. One of the things that I learned, and I will never forget the lesson I learned in that Bible study, was the importance of, of seeing where God is at work around us and then joining him there. In other words, try to find out where God is active, where God is blessing and then join him into that blessing, as opposed to saying, God, here's what I'm going to do, now bless what I'm doing. And so many of us live lives, we don't pay attention to what God's doing often. We say, God, pay attention to what I'm doing, and bless me right here. And God's saying, that's fine, but that's not where you're going to meet me. You're going to hear my voice when you see what I'm doing around you, and join me there. It's a very important question. Would you write this down? Notice what is burning around us. 
Notice what's on fire around us. And oftentimes, it's the most ordinary thing, a bush, a thorn bush in a desert. It's extraordinary, though, because even though this ordinary thing is on fire, it's not burning up. That gets our attention. Stop and pay attention. With it, when it comes to bushes, pay attention. But also when it comes to people. When it comes to people, pay attention. People might be the bushes that God puts around you. Are you walking by people that God's trying to get your attention through a person? Jesus talks about this quite frequently. The importance of the least of these. If you see somebody who's hurting around you, it's easy to just walk by it. But do you stop and pay attention? That cold cup of water that God never forgets, that everybody else would think, well, what's the big difference about the way you treat that child, the way you treat a person who's just not that important in the world's eyes? Jesus said these least of these moments are the ones that can surprise us most in life. God can even meet us in a stranger that walks alongside us. And we don't even recognize it. Do you remember the story after Jesus rose from the dead that two of his disciples were walking along the road and they were so discouraged because not only did Jesus die on the cross and they believed he was the Messiah, but now they find out through the women who came from the empty tomb that the body is gone and they're troubled and they're disturbed and they have all these questions. They had such hope. And now their hope was dashed, and there's this stranger who meets them on the road and says, what's troubling you? What's on your mind? And they start talking to this person that they don't recognize, and they come to find out later it was Jesus, the resurrected Christ, walking alongside of them. An ordinary-looking person. He wasn't shining and glowing as they met him. They had no reason to think he's the resurrected Jesus. God met them in a person. That's like a burning bush. And, and that was happening right around them. But notice this. Pay attention to what happened to their story. It's on the screen. It's recorded in Luke's gospel. It says, when he was at the table with them, they had a meal with this stranger. When the stranger was with them at the table, notice the table. Always tables, right? Meals, food. The stranger, it's Jesus, took bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Pay attention to what's happening around you, but also pay attention as a follower of Jesus, what's happening inside of you. What's burning in your heart? Is there something that God's doing inside of you? And that's what they're saying. Weren't our hearts burning within us? So we have burning bushes outside of us, around us, where God's at work. Pay attention to what God's doing in your heart. Would you write this down? Notice what's burning within us. Notice what's burning within us. To discern God's will and to hear his call is to pay attention to the burning bushes. To pay attention to what's burning inside of us. And then once that happens, we can say, with the song that we heard earlier from the choir, we can say, Lord, here I am. Once we've paid attention, we can say, okay, God, I'm here. What do you have to say to me? Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. You have my attention. Look at verse 4. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and notice what Moses says, here I am. Here I am. Very simple words, and you'll notice this. When Moses speaks in this story, it's very short, it's very punctuated. Here I am. And it has questions. He has questions. Short to the point questions. Look at verse 5. Don't come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. When you and I see the extraordinary work of God in the ordinary bushes around us and within us, 
We're standing on holy ground. We're standing in a place that's holier than we thought it was just a few moments earlier. And it's time to, so to speak, take off our shoes and say, okay, I'm paying attention. Verse 6, then he said, this is God speaking. God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So like I said, Moses, when he speaks, it's very short. It's right to the point, and he has questions. But when God speaks, it's interesting. When you look at what God says, God keeps repeating himself. God, keeps, God says a lot to Moses, much more than Moses says to God. God says a lot to Moses. Moses. He keeps repeating himself. He keeps saying, I know your family history. I know where you come from. I know where you've been. I know what they're going through in Egypt. I know, I know, I know, I know. And Moses, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Look at verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. And I've heard them crying because of their slave drivers. And I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down. You see, this is what God does. He sees. God sees. God, God hears what's going on. He's not, he's, he's not unaware of it. And, and God's concerned. He's gonna, and then God comes down and enters into it. I'm, I've come down. I'm coming down to rescue them. And then look what it says. To bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land. A land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 9. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. I've seen how people have been treated, people created in my image. I'm not just passing by. I'm, I'm watching how people treat people. That's a burning bush, by the way. How people are treating people is a burning bush to pay attention to. In verse 10, it says, the Lord says, so now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. What I want you to take away from this, these first 10 verses is that if we ignore the burning bushes that God places around us and the people he places in our lives and what's going on in our hearts, if we, if we ignore those, we're never going to hear the call of God. We're never going to be changed. Look at verse 10. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? His first question was, Are you paying attention? Did you see that? He stopped and he looked. Am I paying attention? This here is a different question. It's a question that carries us as we follow Jesus. Never stop paying attention as you follow Jesus. Ask the question, am I paying attention? But here's the next question that Moses brings up, is who am I? That's a question. We got to let that question carry us. Never stop asking that question. Lord, who am I? Would you write this down? Lord, who am I? Very simple. We question ourselves sometimes, and that's not a bad thing. And sometimes we even turn those questions into objections to God. And by the way, that's not a bad thing to say, Lord, I have a problem with this. I'm struggling with this. And you bring it to God in your relationship with Jesus. You bring it before him, and you listen to what he has to say. Because when we encounter the risen Jesus, it's disorienting. He shakes our world. But never forget, it's reorienting too. It's not only disorienting, but it's reorienting. And so that goes on as we continue to follow Jesus. That never stops. And we need to let these good questions do the work God wants to do in our hearts because God calls us to be who we are, not what somebody else thinks we should be. God calls us to be who he wants us to be, not who you think you're supposed to be. And that means with all of your frailties, all of your faults, all of your background, all of our limits, all of those things, God comes to us, this is amazing, God comes to us at the place where we feel the most vulnerable and the most human. We're just human. Who am I? Lord, who am I? I don't deserve this burning bush. 
I don't deserve to hear your voice. I don't deserve to hear these words. Would you write this down? Humbly admit God, humbly admit our God-given limits. Boy, it's hard for us to admit our limits. But limits are a gift from God. And limits are the things that God uses to keep us grounded and keep us humble. Here, here's what I'm talking about. We have physical limits. We have age limits. There's things perhaps we can't do today that we could have done 20 years ago. There's age limits. We have emotional limits. We can only take so much. We've been through so much. Lord, how much more of this can I take? We have emotional limits. Limits are a gift from God. We have time limits. I only have so much time, Lord. We have time limits. But here's what you always have time for. Paying attention to what God's doing around you. You have time for that. We all do. You have time to stop before God and say, God, who am I? Let me get a grip on who I am. You see, once you experience the holiness of God as Moses did, once you see who God is, you get a much better understanding of who you are. Who am I? Because what was formed in the wilderness of our lives is about to give birth to action. Because God's call is always bigger than us. When God interacts with you and speaks to you, it's not just so that we can get a warm, fuzzy feeling like, oh, that feels so good, I have so much peace. There's always a bigger purpose. Your relationship with God is a conduit, not a cul-de-sac. It's a conduit. When you receive something from God, it's because you're going to have something to give to someone else. We're not spiritual hoarders. We're not looking for dramatic experiences that are very real. We want to see other people experience this same Jesus. So God's call is always bigger than us. Because God is always saying, I've got somebody I want you to lead out of Egypt. There's some other little, there's some person, some person in your life, some situation that God's going to use you to influence them to experience freedom in Christ. And that's why God says, look at verse 10. God says, so now go. I'm sending you. Would you write this down? Obediently go for the benefit of others. Obediently go for the benefit of others. And that's not going to answer all your questions. Well, how? Why? When? Where? We have all those questions. And it's like, until I can get all of my questions answered, God, I'm not going anywhere. And God says, no, I want you to go. With all of your unanswered questions, those questions are going to make a chariot that carries you, paying attention, asking, Lord, who am I? And like Moses, sometimes we try to argue with God. We try to argue him out of what he's calling us to do. We say that what Moses said. We said, but Lord, I'm only a shepherd. I'm just a shepherd. I got, I got this staff in my hand. And boy, that staff's going to come back over and over and over again. This ordinary staff, kind of like an ordinary bush. I got this ordinary shepherd's staff in my hand. I'm holding it, and it's like, God says, yeah, I can do amazing things with the ordinary stuff that you've been carrying around in your hand. That's not just a staff. And we'll see that next week. But Lord, I'm only a shepherd. They're not going to listen to me. I've been gone for 40 years. They've probably forgotten all about me in Egypt. Oh, no. No, they haven't. Look at verse 12, and God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So this is really something. We have, our objecti our, we have objections to what God wants us to do. We have objections. And those objections push us into a past that we think we can't escape. That's what our object, we try to use our objections oftentimes to push us into the past. Oh, I can't get away from this. This is all I've ever been. This is all I'll ever be. And what the Lord does in those moments is he brings his presence to overcome our objectives, our objections. And he opens up a future of faith that we would never have imagined. 
We want to be stuck in our past. And God is pushing us into the future where we're going to have a greater reality of faith in him. And this is what happens. We use our objections to make it about us. Lord, it's all about me. And God says, no, it's not about you. It's about me. It's always about God. So would you write this down from verse 12? Ultimately, worship is for the glory of God. It's about God. It's about what God's doing. And Moses is kind of like that piece of dry wood in that burning bush that's being, it's on fire with God's presence, but it's not being consumed. In other words, he's not being harmed by the presence of God. Even though Moses takes off his shoes because it's holy ground and he hides his face from God because of what's happening, He's not being destroyed by the presence of God. There's a mercy and a grace that God gives us that we can endure his presence, that we can have the living God within us, working within us and working around us so that not only are we blessed, not only do we understand who we are, not only have we paid attention to what God's saying, but God is calling us to make a difference in the world that we're in so that we are a conduit and not a cul-de-sac. We're called to make a difference. It's as if the Lord is saying, Moses, it's my presence through you and in you that's going to touch people's lives. It's my presence that's doing that. I'm not going to destroy you with my presence. I'm going to remake you with my presence. And Moses, it's not about you. It's about me. Look at verse 13. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, what's his name? Then what shall I tell them? What's his name? Am I paying attention? Am I bringing my question to God, who am I? And here's the next question that's going to carry us. Would you write this down, the third question? Lord, who are you? What's your name? If people ask me who you are, who do I tell them that you are? Because by knowing God's name, we know God. You ever wonder why God's name is so important to him? Don't take his name in vain. It's in the top ten list, right? His name is very important to him. Because if you know the name of God, you know your God. Your God's name defines your relationship with him. He's no longer just the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob way back there. He's now your God. He's your God. You have to experience him yourself, his name. Who are you, Lord? Who are you? I don't know if you knew this, but I found this very interesting this week as I was doing my research in this passage in the the ancient Near Eastern culture at this time, the names of the gods were like a password. Like a password. And so if you claimed that a god spoke to you, you would want to know their name. You needed their password. Their name was a password. And and once you have that password name, you now, you now have control over that God. You can do miracles or tricks or whatever in the name of that God. So knowing that God's name gives you authority, you can tap into him. And in a sense, you can control him. And here we see the Lord has a name. It's a secret name. And he doesn't share his entire identity. He doesn't give Moses the entire password. Why? Because this God cannot be controlled. This God cannot be controlled. To reveal the name is to disclose the secret. And so look what God says in verse 14. This is all God says. And people look at this and go, what does this mean? This is part of the mystery. Look at verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And that's not Popeye stuff. Okay, that's not Popeye stuff here. This isn't cartoon stuff. For those of you who are younger, there's a cartoon years ago called Popeye. And whenever he ate spinach, okay, forget it. You can, you, tell you what, Google it, you'll find out. So God says to Moses, I am who I am. In other words, 
I will be who I will be. Well, Lord, who should I say sent me? That doesn't tell me much. I need need more of your password. Give me more of your password. And so look what the Lord says in verse 14, in the second half of the verse. He says to Moses, this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am. I am. His name is I am. God's name is I am. I am has sent me to you. What does that mean? That means that God is the who. All the questions you and I have, who, what, where, when, why, how, God is the who, God is the when, God is the where, God is the why, God is the how, God is all those things. He's not going to reveal it all to you right now. And by the way, for the Jewish faith, merely uttering the name of God in Hebrew is forbidden. They wouldn't say the name of God. And historically, the pronunciation of this name, it was actually forgotten. They forgot it. They intentionally forgot the password that God gave Moses. And it just has four consonants that we see as the letter Y, the letter H, the letter W, the letter H, which we then call Yahweh. But we don't even know today if even those four consonants are being vocalized the right way because they We're taught to forget the name in case you violate the name of God. That's how sacred it was. God doesn't condemn us for our doubt, but he also doesn't satisfy us just for our curiosity. Come on, God, you're like a genie in a bottle, right? Give me the name, I can get my wishes. God says, nope, you can't control me like that. I am that I am. God won't let us take him and put him in a box and set him on a shelf. Okay, got that all figured out. Next. That's not how God's name works. God says, I will show you who I am, Moses, as time goes on, but I'm not going to explain myself to you fully right now. Look at verse 15. God also said to Moses, verse 15, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. The people forgot God. They have been in bondage for so long. Their misery is so deep, they're not even asking God to help them. They're just screaming out in agony. All they probably know are the Egyptian gods. All they know is their place in life. All they know is that they're the bushes who get burned up and consumed and who cares anything about them. All they know is their lives get poured out. Their blood gets poured out on the sand. It just like dribbles away, just absorbs into nothing. That's all they know. But God says, I know the future. God says, I know the future, verses 16 through 22. God knows the people are going to believe when they hear from Moses. God knows that Pharaoh is going to resist Moses. Look at verses 16 through 22. God knows the Egyptians are going to be plagued. God knows that they're going to be set free. The people will be set free. God knows that the Egyptians are going to be so happy to see them leave that they're going to actually give them everything they want. Here's some gold. Here's some silver. Take it. Just get out of here. I want you to know the password before you leave church today. The name of Jesus is the password. Would you write this down? Jesus is the I am. Jesus is the password. He is the full revelation of who God is. He is God. If you have met Jesus, you have met God. Look at the passage on the screen. I want you to see this from John's gospel. It's an interaction Jesus had with the leaders of Israel at the time who were skeptics. And it says on the screen, they asked him the question, are you greater than our father Abraham? They're asking Jesus that. He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Do you see that? They asked Jesus, who do you think you are? Who do you think that you are? You think your name's all that great? And look what Jesus said. If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. 
My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it, and he was glad. And they look at Jesus, and they say, are you crazy? Look what it says next. You're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Who are you? Who do you think you are? And Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, what does he say? I am. Jesus is claiming to be Yahweh in the flesh. And they knew it so clearly. They said, you must die. You not only used God's name, you claim to be God, and we're going to kill you for it. And so look what they do. They pick up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away. It wasn't the time for him to go to the cross. Jesus is the password. Jesus' name is above all names. Would you write this down as we close? When we follow Jesus with our questions, we find our calling. Are you paying attention? Are you asking God, who am I? Are you saying, God, who are you? And you know it's Jesus. Get to know Jesus and follow him. Let's stand and pray together as we conclude the service today. Please stand. Who do we think you are? Lord Jesus, we believe you are God. You are God in a human body with a human nature. You are the God who saw what we were suffering and you came down and entered into this world. You are a God who saw and heard and were concerned and you came to be the deliverer. You are God's only begotten son. And we believe in you. And we want to do a better job today as we follow you of paying attention to the burning bushes that you've placed around us and paying attention to the burning bushes that are happening within our hearts. We bring to you our questions. Who are we? And Jesus, that we would get to know you more. That we know who you are. You are the great I am. So fill us with your spirit as we go from this place. Give us the hope that we need. For we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Go in peace.